Welcome to Cash Talk, the podcast where we delve into the depths of finance, business, and life itself. I'm your host, John Casher, a multi-award winning wealth advisor with a passion for empowering ambitious Australians to confidently achieve financial freedom. Hey everyone, before we get started, this is a quick reminder that everything in this podcast is of a general nature and nothing has been tailored to your personal circumstances. So please seek personal financial advice before acting on this information. Hey everyone and welcome back to another Cash Talk. Today I'm joined by JK, uh, actually known as JK in our team, but real name, John Kutarupas. How are you, mate? Good, thanks, mate. How are you? That's it. It's actually hard to get your real name out, to be honest with you. I call you JK all the time. Yeah, it sounds it sounds weird. Even if someone calls me at work, they call me John. It just doesn't sound right. It's like calling your teacher by their first name. Yeah, it does feel yeah. a little bit like that. Um, just for everyone to know, JK has been a mentee of mine for a number of years, I think six or seven years now. Six years. Six years now. And um, essentially, he is one of the partners in Thriving Wealth, started his journey very young, uh, similar to the journey of Anthony, but I'd like to say that I've taught you everything I, I, I know, but you've learned a little bit more along the way as well too. And um, today we're going to be speaking about a very important topic because I know, JK, you've got a real passion about investing, um, so do I, but also it's around the psychology around that. So today we're going to be delving deep into the psychology of investing and the importance of doing it right. So- mm-hmm. JK, when did you start your investing journey? And um, yeah, when did you start your investing journey? Yeah, so it started when I was about 16. I was essentially starting my first sort of retail job, as you do when you're um, when you're still at high school. And I was saving really well, not really spending anything at that age. And I was just looking at the money in the bank account going, this can't be right. Like, there's there's got to be a way for this money to work harder. Mm-hmm. And at the time, my old man, he was you know, delving into stocks, trying to trade, all that sort of thing. And, you know, me and my brother had spoken about it as well and, you know, started to like do it with play money, essentially Mm -hmm. just to practice. And then I thought, well, why not? Let's just give it a crack with the money that I'm earning. What have I got to lose? Um, I'm still young. You know, you can't, yes, you can lose it, but at the same time too, if if there's a time to take the risk, it's now, not later. So I took the pun and essentially started trying to stock pick. Mm -hmm. I was looking at trying to do what they call technical analysis where you're, looking at charts, trying to find patterns, all that sort of stuff. And it kind of went well, then it didn't go so well. And definitely learned some, especially in hindsight, there was some really good lessons to be learned there around behavioral investing, mm. um, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get into later on. But yeah, that was that was essentially how it started. Mm. And then I think I was probably lucky enough that I found you as well, mate, in that, in that sense where, you know, I got to learn more about investing and, you know, index investing and, you know, not trying to time the market and all that sort of thing, which was also a lot less stressful, I guess, doing it that way too, and a lot less time consuming. Mm. And that was really letting your money work for you mm. as opposed to, you know, trying to actively trade where it's almost like a part-time job. So thanks for sharing that. So if I look at the 16-year-old kid that was investing. Mm. If we're going to be truthful mm. for everyone, it was, it was greed fueling that, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And it's at the end of the day, it was a get-rich-quick thing for me. It was, you know, you look at it and go, well, if I can make, you know, even 1% or 2% a day, mm. you could become a millionaire in the next couple of years. Like, it's, I'm not exactly sure what the numbers work out to be, but it's it, if those numbers worked, mm. yes, that was, that was the main driver for it is, mm. you know, just trying to be a millionaire in your 20s. Yeah, and I, and I can resonate very, very, resonate very similar to that story, JK, when I first was young, you know, you get into something, trying to make money and mm. trying to be in the next Lambo or mm. the next Ferrari or whatever it's going to be. And, and you utilize investing, hopefully, to be that tool that's going to get you quickly to that point. Yeah. And yet, what was very fortunate is that you learned from a very young age that at the moment, at that moment, mm. time is actually your best friend, not your worst enemy. Correct. Correct. And so if you can use time wisely... You can get a, a much more confidence, um, higher probability of getting to that goal that you want to achieve. Where, if you're using that kind of strategy that you deployed, mm. for a very very small percentage of people, it can work. Yeah. But for for a whole lot um, others, it's not going yeah. to. So, we'll talk about um, that because it's very common mm. that people use that type of investing style and that, 
and we talk about greed and we talk about behaviours, it's not that I am totally against people doing technical analysis trading. I think it has its place. Mm -hmm. However, I think a lot of people do it for the wrong reasons and they build that as their core investing approach, which is just fueling that ever ending, never ending kind of greed Correct. side of things. Yeah. yeah. I would, I'd look at it more as like an income stream mm -hmm. or like a second income mm -hmm. as opposed to an investment strategy. So mm -hmm. what, if, if that's something that is working for you, the way I'd look at it and go, well, this is now part of my income. Mm -hmm. So anything that I earn from this, mm -hmm. it's just be as if you're working a normal job that I've got to put X away to, you know, my debt, X percentage away to my investment strategy, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. And that investment strategy is your long-term investment strategy, not your active trading investment strategy. Mm. I, I like to put it as, for me, any, anyway, it, that, that would be my cream. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I don't do that at all. Mm. Okay. And the reason is, is because I believe I don't have to. Yeah. yeah? And I would like my time spent elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an interest mm. in that. And it's like I said, it's it's not that I'm against people doing that type of trading. However, I do feel that there's a lot of I think I know. Mm. And we talk about this a lot, J Cat, and obviously I've spoken to you a lot about it. The most dangerous person is to think I think they know. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been like proven to me from long term data. Mm. That it works. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And it's around, there's a lot of luck in it. Mm -hmm. And so for for my family mm -hmm. and for me, I'm not in it to roll the dice on what I'm trying to create for my family and for me. Correct. So I try and move, remove every sort of emotion out of my investments mm -hmm. as much as possible mm -hmm. and have a clear objective in regards to what I'm going, going to do. Um, I'm looking to purchase a property right now and we're going to go bidding tonight. Mm. And my wife spoke to me around, you know, do we all want to be there? What's mm. the scenario? And I said, no, I don't want none of you there. Yeah. This is a business transaction. Mm. You know, I'm going to take this the same way that I do in everything I do. Correct. Spoke to my lawyer to review the contracts, making yeah. sure it's all honky door. And if it's mm. not good, don't get emotionally connected Correct. to it. There's another. So everything I do, mm. I'm removing emotion mm. because it's the emotional side of that style of investing where greed, especially mm. not so much fear. Yeah. Mm. Actually people tend to break through fear in regards to trading. Correct. Yeah. It's that greed factor that mm. just fuels that I want more, I want more, I want more until the point where you've chased that endorphin so high Correct. that it's that one foul of put too much on the line and then everything's gone. Correct, yeah. And I think a good example of sticking to that was I remember this was probably maybe a couple of years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking to me about purchasing a property that you didn't actually end up mm -hmm. getting. Mm -hmm. And... I remember at the time you'd done sort of the numbers in regards to like to work out, you know, the future earnings and what you, what you want to get out of that investment and the strategy behind it and what you need to pay for that strategy to work out. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, you probably remember it better mm -hmm. than I do, but it was, you know, something like once it hit, literally hit that price, you were just like, I'm out because it's not worth it anymore. And that was basing that decision on logic, not mm -hmm. on, you know, emotions or anything like that. Correct. And, and, and you can't. When it comes to property, you can't be as passive mm. is in regards to you need to go there, you need to find a house. It's not like you can automatically dollar cost average into Correct. it, into a property. So you've got to come in with a predetermined strategy. And reality is what I am trying to do for myself, which we speak about with our mm. clients all the time, is just to remove that emotion mm. because it's that emotional behavior mm. where you're making mistakes. And for all of you, I want you to think about the worst financial decision you've made and be honest with yourself. Has the emotions got the better of you? And if the answer is yes to that, mm -hmm. well, you don't want to repeat that next yeah, time. Correct. So what's some, of the, what's some of the emotions that you find that people have that are working against them or what kind of, yeah. what, what do you find, JK? Yeah, I think there's probably two main ones. Mm -hmm. um, one is what we call overconfidence bias, which mm -hmm. is 
you know, what you alluded to before around, you know, thinking that they know it all and, you know, they've got it. You're essentially too confident in the decisions that you're making. Mm. And that, you know, that blinds you to some of the risks in that strategy of what you're trying to do. And the other one is confirmation bias. So when you're looking for information about something that you think is a good idea, mm. your brain is validating that information that you're receiving that's good. Mm. But then the information that's maybe contrary to that decision is very, you know, you sort of just go, oh, no, don't worry about it. It's not it's sort of not that important or not significant. And it's those two things that sort of lead people to making these decisions that end up essentially burning them in the long term. So with those two, just – and there is plenty of others, guys. Um, there's some people that don't have enough confidence and Correct. therefore don't yeah. take enough risk Correct. as well too to get to where they need to get to. But these two we'll focus on. So with the overconfidence wise, mm. how does a person – how does a person first become aware that this mm. is the case? And then second of all, what is a, what's a solution to fix that? Yeah. So it's, it's a tricky one in the moment to actually be aware of it. And that's where the, the first thing that I jump to is, you know, talk to a professional about this because mm. if, for example, clients coming to see us, they're not going to have that overconfidence bias because the strategies that we implement around, you know, their investment strategy and everything, it's, it's based on logic. And it's also based on a fixed rule. So there's no there's no emotions getting in the way of it. The other one is to is around just essentially trying to educate yourself as much as possible before delving into these things. Because if you're not educated, that's when you start to sort of, you know, read a bit of information and go, oh yeah, I've got this covered, this is easy. And then that's when you have that, you know, that bad decision based on overconfidence. And, and if you're if you're in your occupation, if you think if you're in the medical game, if you're a tradie or whatever. You may see other people that aren't in your trade or aren't in your industry yeah. doing certain things where you're like, why the hell are they putting themselves at risk or doing certain things? It's exactly the same thing. We see this all the time and we see people, especially in the investing game, get that overconfidence mm -hmm. because they've got a few winners. Yeah. And if you delve into it, the winners are mainly luck. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Everyone can make money when everyone's making money. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's when, you know, money markets aren't making money. Yeah where you need to be resilient and be able to kind of make sure that your portfolio can withstand Correct. what's happening there. Correct. And emotions on the way down. A lot of people, I'm going to say everyone in my generation, everyone in your generation, 99% mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. have not really felt mm -hmm. the grunt mm -hmm. of a proper crash mm -hmm. in Australia. When was the last property crash that people experienced mm. that was severe? Mm. In the stock market, when was the last one that mm. was severe? Mm. I told you before, and we've spoken about this, the COVID crash that happened, the V-shaped recovery, that was, that was the worst thing for investor behavior mm. because markets crashed, mm. money got printed, mm. and it was a V-shape, and no yes. one really felt it. Yep. GSC, we're talking 2008, mm. yeah? Mm. My generation, I was 20 at the time, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, yeah, 20 at the time, most 20 year olds weren't actively mm. participating in the market. Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. So you've got to be born and say in the 19, say seventies. Mm. Yeah. Even er maybe early eighties mm. to really feel the grunt yeah. of what the GFC looked like. And I can see that when you talk to investors that are in their forties plus mm. to the ones that are in their forties or less, yeah. the forties less are, they don't feel invincible. Yeah, the, 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 the people that are 40 plus have that that scar or that scratch mm. where they've felt being fallen over before and what that does, and they're yeah. more cautious. And people say that's when you get older. Yes, it does happen because you get older because you have more of their life experiences, mm. but there's a lot of people taking unnecessary risk and are overconfident yeah. because of the circumstances that have played out in these markets. Yeah. And it, people need to feel a crash to have the proper understanding of what ups and downs look like, both in the property market and in the stock mm. market as well. Mm. I think the other one, um, so, and, the, and the other one you were talking about was confirmation mm. bias, which mm. is huge. Mm. And I think this is the rise of, all, of things like cryptocurrency. Yeah. I see a lot of uh, meme stocks. Mm. Um, there's a lot of speculative invest, investing, mm. like regional areas that are mm. in the middle of Timbuktu. Mm. With the rise of social media, mm. There is so much info information 
it's just hard to make objective decisions. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And psychologically speaking, the only way that I have found to cut through both of those mm. is, well, f information is just turn it all off. Mm. Turn off the noise. Mm. Make sure your sources are from mm. proper sources mm. and from data-driven sources. Mm. Someone who comes out with a hedge fund knowledge mm. doesn't necessarily mean that that he's what he's saying to, to is right for you, mm. because his situation or her situation is completely different mm. to what your situation is. And if you apply what you're listening from that person or hearing from that person to you, mm. it could be detrimental. Correct. If you're on social media and you're flicking across everyone's got their opinion on how to get rich and it's feeding on that greed and that fear. Mm. So you need to cut through the, cut through the mm. BS, mm. turn it all off, mm. speak to a professional who's going to customize it to you. Mm. I th also think it's very hard for you to do it on your own mm. properly. Mm. You can do the basics on mm. your own, but to take it to that next level really hard because you just don't know what's affecting you unless you've got someone looking in the mirror. Correct. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just going back to the whole sort of overconfidence and confirmation bias thing is we see this all the time in the stock market. Like you mentioned COVID before. These are the ones where every time we see a bubble, every time we see a crash, most of the time it's just a reflection of the emotions happening in the stock market. Hugely. It's not based on, you know, the risk versus return trade off of these investments. And that's mm. really changing significantly. It's just more. You know, for example, when we are in a bubble, like I'll use the dot-com bubble for an, for example, that was everyone being overconfident that these, you know, these tech companies are going to be the next big, next big thing. And that's where you have a bubble because everyone's just, you know, validating their decisions based on, you know, what they're hearing from other people and, you know, all this other noise that's coming through. So, yeah, if you are turning down the noise, then yes, you would have pretty much completely avoided that or, you know, investing in those companies. And that even goes back to what Warren Buffett says, which is being fearful when people are greedy and being greedy when people are fearful. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ways to control this overconfidence bias because you're essentially just going, in a way, going against the crowd. And it's it's easy to say hard to do. when it, It's easy to say hard to do. And what I mean by that is most people say that they will sell when things are high mm -hmm. and buy when things are low. Mm. But the reality is, is both of us know mm. that, that is not the case. No. Yeah. When COVID was crashing, mm. I still remember being here with you and remember the guy, he ran across the road and he's like, oh, um, you know, everything's crashing. I've got money in my superannuation. Can you help me just pull it out? Mm. And I remember we came up here and I, I was saying to you and I, was, I think I was saying to Anth as well too, and I'm just like, we need to throw everything at the stock market yeah. right now if that's what's happening. Correct, yeah. And it goes on to obviously what Buffett said, but the reality is is that person's emotions mm. was just getting the better of him. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and markets do take time to recover. So just for everyone to understand that, it's not about markets go down, you pump your money, and then you're going to make ROI immediately. Mm. Correct. And so even the psychology around expectations mm. is also correct also skewed i think yeah. Yeah. yeah when we're having conversations with people that you know when i go out it's like oh just throw your money at this and then you're mm. gonna make listen let's talk straight gfc uh australian market i think is asx 200 yeah yep. took 11 years yeah. to get back to where it was before mm. Mm. 11 years yeah people are like don't they go down by two to three there's no like set rule no, it's, it's random it's random yeah. do you know what i mean and then you can you look at like the japanese market yeah, yeah? you look at even the japanese property market mm -hmm. yeah and these are like extreme cases mm -hmm. of long-term mm -hmm. recessions in regards to these markets and not recovering back to where they were mm -hmm. so i think long term you remove if you think long term you reduce your risk yeah yeah however yeah, I think I think people's expectations and the psychology around I'm just going to make money from the stock market. Yeah. I'm going to make money from the property market. 
we have both seen yep. that that's not the case. Yeah, correct, correct. And like going back to that example, that guy you saw across the street wanted to pull all all of his money out of super. How do you like? How do you stop that? Like, how do you like? For me, when I look at that, I say, well, this guy's sounds to me mm-hmm. like he's got money that he needs in the short term mm-hmm. that he's got invested as a long term investment strategy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the th- the thing is, is that most people. When it comes to their investments, they set they set them they set their investments up just randomly. Mm-hmm. There's no actual thought process okay. around this, mm-hmm. and so if you look at things logically, mm-hmm. you need to have a strategy simply to reduce risk. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. the assets will do what the assets are going to do. Mm-hmm. You are not going to control them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't control the property market. You can't control the stock market. So if you can't control that, Mm. what can you control? Mm. So first and foremost, you can control your behaviors. Mm. Okay, how do I do that? Well, if you wanna be honest with yourself, get someone to get an honest assessment about where you're at, Mm. build a predetermined strategy, Mm -hmm. and then stick to it. Regardless of the emotions, base it on the logic. Second thing is then when that strategy is getting built, how can we reduce risks? Well, you spoke about one. One is, Long-term assets are in long-term buckets Mm. that aren't exposed to short-term needs. Mm. What I mean by that is if you're saving for a wedding in the next two to three years, you might want to have a more extravagant wedding. So you get into that greed uh, greed side of things. You put your money in the stock market because it's been making so much percent returns and you're like, oh, well, I'm going to have the best wedding in the world because of look at the returns it's made. Rather than me having 15 grand, I'm going to have 30 and then we're going to go to an amazing honeymoon. Well, if your wedding's in two to three years' time and you have a market correction or a market mm-hmm. crash within that time, you're not having any wedding at all. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure you who's getting married soon wouldn't be putting your wedding savings into that. Not a chance. And this is the reality. I know I'm kind of creating a bit of a story, but this is a reality of a story that was once told to me in the GFC that Mm -hmm. happened. So one is looking at the time horizon in which you need that money and then allocating it the right way. So wedding funds, for example, in the short term, well, it's likely that they're going to be in cash-related products because they're secure. They're safe. Mm -hmm. We want to be making sure we've got the certainty of the money. And taking away that greed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, you might need to extend your extend your wedding in six months from now. Mm-hmm. Well, it is what it is. Or Correct. pick up another job to earn some more income. Correct. Don't look at investments as a fast way to do things. Correct. And I, you know when you've got like the recommended fuel that you put in your car? Mm. You don't just go and throw nitrous in your car, <laughs> yeah, just hoping that it's going to... You put nitrous in your car, just naturally speaking, the car engine's going to blow up. Yeah. You're not going to have a car at all. It's the same thing that people do when it comes to investing. Yeah. So long-term long-term buckets have long-term assets, which have growth-related assets, which have risks to them. But you cannot need that money in the next... Uh, they say seven years as a minimum. I like to use 10, yeah. to be honest with you. Um, and I think cycles are going longer. We're finding bull markets are happening mm-hmm. longer. Reality without the printing, I would expect um, bear markets to mm-hmm. happen for longer. Mm-hmm. So if that's the case, that needs to be longer. Short-term buckets, m- minimum 12 months you should be mm-hmm. aiming for of expenditure. Mm-hmm. But if that's longer, so, and then you've got this medium-term bucket, which is what we call an income bucket, yeah, yeah? which is mm-hmm. to create that income. And it's it, it's the risk is determined on the objectives that you need to achieve. But- there's no emotion Correct. around what I'm talking about. Mm. And the psychology psychology around it is simply like, how do I create the highest confidence and probability of achieving what I want to achieve? Mm. Yep. Now, what also people forget, and I've found this happen in today's society, is they're scared to go out there and earn more money. Mm. There's this, I was seeing a TikTok the other day, and I'm not on TikTok mm. much, <laughs> but I was on this TikTok <laughs> And um, I think I was posting something uh, for the business anyway. And there was this guy that was saying like, he's 29 years of age. He doesn't want to work. He doesn't want to work for like these big companies with yachts and stuff like that. He's 29 years of age and not working. I'm just thinking to myself, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? Like, 
I understand you want to live life. I get that. Mm. But the world's not going to change overnight no. into this area where everything's free and you can... Mm. So if you want some level of basic needs of security, mm. people don't go out to actually earn more. Yeah. I, think, I think there's two ways we can accelerate our ability to get to where we need mm. to get to. People look at investments as the easy way to yeah, do things. Correct. First, you need to look at the hard way. Mm. Master the hard way, mm -hmm. which is earning money through personal exertion. Correct. Then using the investments to be the easier way. So Correct. like when I look at myself, it's like work your butt off, mm. become a good financial mm. advisor, mm. get into business, mm. become a good business person, yeah. master that as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Then once you've got the good income flowing in from your mastery of yourself, which mm. is invest in yourself, guys, yep. yeah? Mm -hmm. then using that income to then build this structure and then supercharge that. Correct, correct. And at the end of the day, your biggest wealth building tool is your income. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And it also allows you to de-risk. Yeah. Like if someone's if someone's earning a million dollars a year mm. and they throw their money at a bank account, mm. they could possibly live life mm. easily mm. by just the interest that's in that bank account. Correct, yeah. Does that make sense? Whereas if someone's earning $50,000 a year, mm. if they put money into their bank account mm. at 5% based on a, a savings rate of whatever, numbers don't lie. Yeah. Correct. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I know percentages are the same, but mm. there's a bigger percentage of 5% of $10 million yeah. worth of assets rather than 5% of $100,000 yeah. worth of assets. So the, the, what you're getting at is the more assets you have, mm -hmm. the less percentage return you need to get the same dollar value as someone else with less assets. So you don't need to take on as much risk to get that same dollar return. I argue, yeah, correct, yeah. I argue that it's easier for you to earn $10,000 more from your personal exertion mm. than it is to earn from your yeah. investments. Yeah, for sure. Okay? Mm. So just think about that for a second. Mm. Yeah? Mm. You're off spending hours and hours trying to figure out the right investments mm. to earn 10 grand. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Where you could maybe just go back to your employer or start a hot side hustle mm. or whatever's going to be. And I'm not saying it's easy, yeah. but I would argue that it's easier mm to earn $10,000 from your personal exertion yeah. than from your investments. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, so it's like the psychology around also just wealth building. Yeah. And it, it's a little bit, it, it's a little bit, I'm not going to say it's strange. It's a little bit just people need to have a bit of a reality check. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Mm. And not be scared of using different sources of income mm both investing income, personal exertion mm. income, mm. and really trying to harness both of those. Yeah. And especially in your 20s and 30s, mm. there's no time to, like, it, it, don't muck around. Yeah. Yeah, people mm. will, like, enjoy life. Yes, I'm an advocate for enjoy life. Travel the world, mm. see everything, you know, do what you need to mm. do. However, by the time you get to your 40s, mm. yeah, what do you got left? 25 years, say, yeah. of working? Yeah, most people want less, mm. yeah? So if you've spent the first 20 years of working, piss farting around, mm. well, the more you go on, mm. JK, the more risk you've got to take. Yeah, correct. Yeah, we talk about this all the time. The people who start early. It's it, easy. It's easy. Yeah. They look at it, our numbers and the plan we create, mm. and they're like, this can't be true. Mm. No, it is. Yeah. Most people overestimate what they can do in 12 months, underestimate what they can do in 12 years. Correct. You get to someone in their 50s and 60s, mate, we're rolling sleeves up. Yeah. We're doing the most we can yeah. to make work of those years mm. that we have left. And in some cases, these people are behind the eight ball yeah. because they need to now take on more risk. Mm. And when you talk about more risk, it's not more risk, more return. Mm. It's more potential return. Correct. And therefore, if there's more potential return, there's also more potential for loss. Correct. And then you have things like timing risk. Mm. Yeah. Aren't they retiring in the middle of a GFC? Mm. Yeah. And then what does that mean for their retirement? Does that mean they have to work another five years? Mm. So the, the psychology of investing has many, many different angles mm. to it. But now you've been with me for six years. Mm. So we talked about that 16-year-old trader. You've now learned a more holistic approach. Mm. What would you say to that 16-year-old kid? 
That's an interesting question. I think it would definitely be don't get greedy, I think is the biggest one. Because at the end of the day, all, all those emotions are driven by greed. And the second one is around just doing whatever you can to increase your income as much as possible. And that's not necessarily like, yes, working extra is a good way to do it. But at the end of the day, you're just trading time for money. And like, if I look at myself and what I'm doing at the moment, it's just around, you know, educating myself and upskilling as well. How can I be a better advisor? How can I become, you know, more, more qualified in what I'm doing? Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to increase my ability to earn an income, not just by working more, but the work I'm doing is becoming more valuable. And then that's going to, what's going to be increasing my income. That's what's going to allow me to then get to that next level of wealth. Mm. Correct. And, and it's around taking time. Mm. You have to be in our role. He has to be a good financial advisor mm. to become a better business owner, to Correct. then mentor more people. Correct. And it's the business that then has the untapped, unlimited income potential. Correct. Yeah, to then supercharge your investment strategy. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so for the person who's sitting there trading, how much time are you not spending mm. on investing on yourself? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I want you to think about that. And it's I know it's a bit of a psychological shift. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Um, I'd argue, you know, throwing a thousand dollars at upskilling yourself mm. is more valuable than throwing a thousand bucks at a meme stock. Oh, hundred percent. Even <laughs> even at a good quality stock. At like a good that, quality yeah. stock. Yeah. yeah. What is that return on investment for you? One of the best investments I ever did for myself, JK, mm. and you know this mm. because you experienced it, was me going to Stanford. Mm. You know, I went over to Stanford and I was a kid at a candy store. That cost me 12 grand. Yeah. Yeah. What ROI did I get off that $12,000 investment? I couldn't even quantify it. Yeah. I could not even quantify yeah. it. Everyone who knows me knows that that event changed my life. Mm. I came back mm. a totally different person. Mm. Yeah. That was much cheaper exercise yeah. than other exercises I had to do, like my spinal surgery, which taught me about life and fulfillment. Yeah. So if you can invest in yourself, mm. do it. Yeah. But also, if you're wanting to, which I know you love tennis, mm. JK, if you mm. if you want to get great at tennis, mm. not good, mm. if you want to go great, mm. you've got to associate with people that are great. I, yeah, you've got to surround yourself with the best people. And, you know, sports sports are classic example just in general because, you know, even the coaches, or, you know, you bring up the videos of Roger Federer or Rafa, how they, how they do things, how they move, how they, you know, the decisions they make on the court – it's, it's exactly the same in work. You want to spend time being around the best at that job so you can, A, you learn the mistakes mm. earlier. So, you know, even some of the things that you've taught me might have taken you 10 years to work out. Mm. I've learned it in, you know, a half, few, the time. half the time. And then the next people that come after me are going to learn it again in half the time. So that's, that's how naturally we get better. But, yeah, I think that's, yeah, surrounding yourself with the right people is the biggest one. And they take that to your investment strategy. Mm. How many, how many people's lives have I given advice on? Oh, thousands. Thousands. Yeah. How much have we perfected? How much have we mm. seen? How much have we mm. done that? If we took it, take this as a tennis analogy. Mm. I can see your elbow moving out on your serve. Yeah. That you can't see. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And so. The ability for a professional to look around corners you can't see and stopping you from making silly decisions with your money. Correct. How much is that ROI and the investment of having someone like that? Oh, it's it's massive. And at the end of the day, like even if you look at all the clients that we deal with, and you know, we've had clients that have worked with us before, now they're retired, now they're well into retirement. It's like you come to see an advisor who's been through that hundreds of times, you only get to go through it once. So that value of seeing someone who's effectively done it a hundred or thousands of times, how you put value on that is such a hard thing to do. Correct. And then also understands the psychology around things, mm. which is another side of things. See, you can go speak to someone who understands money mm. and numbers. Mm. That's one side of the coin. Mm. You got to understand the behavioral side yeah. and it's very, very unique for someone to understand the behavioral side and then not under, just understand it, but then starting to how, how you change those behaviors mm. and change those habits. I became, I, I created Thriving Wealth, which was formerly AFA group, um, as a numbers business. Mm. Over time, it changed into a behavioral and education business yeah. 
that promotes good behaviors, good education to build the right mm. foundations and fundamentals and then using our advisors to then coach that to our clients Correct. and then the numbers doing what the numbers do. Correct. When that happened after Stanford, mm. I am humbled by the amount of messages and emails mm. and contact that I have mm. around the changing of people's lives. Mm. So what, uh, I know I know the story, but just for everyone else out there, what, what actually happened at Stanford? Like, what was it that made you come back and go, okay, this needs to change or we're doing this wrong? The most pivotal moment for me, I think, was I went to Salesforce, which is a massive tech company uh, in San Francisco. And so we went on like a, let's call it an excursion out mm. of Stanford. And we went there and we were with, in a room of other financial advisors and other mortgage brokers at that point. Mm. And the chief technology officer, I think mm. he was, I think he was CTI, I can't remember his name, but a really, really smart guy. He was talking back in 2017, 18, it was like 2017, 18, I can't remember which year it was, but he was talking about AI. Yeah. That's 2024. Yeah. He's talking about AI back then. Mm. And they've got this thing called Einstein, okay, which works in the back of the CRM. It would do data. It would see all the data and then tell companies around what clients are doing and what customers are doing. Mm. And then from that data that they're getting, obviously then businesses can then approach yep. and do that. All right. So I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. Imagine all the data that I've got. Imagine mm. what we can do. Anyway, go through all of this kind of slides and then up on this massive, it wasn't a whiteboard, it was like this projector screen, let's yeah. talk about it anyway. Um, he goes, by 2000 and I think it was 30, mm. and I could be wrong, it might have been 2004, mm. but for all intents and purposes, it wasn't too far away in the mm. future. All of these jobs are going to be obsolete. And there was like lawyer, accountant, financial advisor, boom, 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 boom. And I'm sitting there going, I've just dedicated like my life to this career mm. and it's going to become obsolete. Mm. You have two things. One, you either just pack up shop mm. and leave mm -hmm. or you go, how can I adapt? And one of the things he said was, these occupations in their current form will be obsolete because AI will make decisions that are better, better and more logical than the person who's giving it. And if you think about this, they're talking about truck drivers were becoming obsolete. Mm -hmm. And if you think I'm talking rubbish, go onto YouTube and type in like AI driven truck mm -hmm. drivers. Think about law, for example. Mm -hmm. You can now with AI, you mm -hmm. can essentially go to a, like you've got a case in regards to a particular mm -hmm. uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And you can search and it will come up with all the precedents and pretty much start to build your case for you. Yep. So if you're thinking about, I'm talking rubbish or this guy's talking rubbish, no, it rolled out in front of my eyes. So I came back here thinking, how am I going to redesign the business to continue to impactfully change? And what's, what's AI going to do where I can work side by side with technology? And I didn't think AI at that point, it was more technology. How can I use technology side by side with me mm. to get a better outcome for our clients. Mm. So if we can use the technology to make better mon money decisions, mm. AI and technology can't make emotional decisions and humans are emotional beasts. And mm. what I'm saying about emotional decisions, what I'm saying is we now built a business where we make people more aware of the emotional decisions they're mm -hmm. making. Mm -hmm. Then educate them mm -hmm. to make better logical decisions based on the technology that we use. And so it's taken time. It hasn't happened mm -hmm. overnight, as you know, mm -hmm. but that was probably the pivotal point. And the second biggest pivotal point was me becoming a father, having major medical issues at the same time. Mm -hmm. So like 2017, 18, then 19 had spinal surgery, um, and meanwhile, I'm having kids during mm. this time. Mm. It told, taught me that life is there to be lived. Mm. So what was once a business focused on amassing the most amount of wealth mm. 
became a business about making sure our clients live the most fulfilled life as they can yep. and enabling the money to just be a vehicle to make that happen. Yeah. And that I truly believe was the icing on the cake because all of these amazing messages and emails that we've been getting on our 15th year anniversary have not been around, thank you, John, for the amazing zeros that I have in my bank mm. account. I couldn't believe how much wealth I've got. Mm. No, it's thank you for allowing my money to do essentially yeah. what my life, what I wanted to do with my life and yeah. live that fulfilled life. Yeah. And, you know, right now I know two clients email me while they're overseas. One's traveling to in, in Paris right now, mm. send me messages saying, you know, like pretty much we wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for you. And they, they're having a pretty luxurious holiday mm. over there. Mm. Um, but we've been, we plan their retirement. They're now enjoying their retirement. We've got clients fulfilling all of their life dreams. Mm. And I'm the, I'm the architect. Yeah. You know, I'm mm. not, I, I don't say that I've done it all for them. They've done it. They've done a mm. hell of a lot. Mm. But I do feel very proud of what this, mm. what we've been able to do for these people. Yeah. And, I think at one point, which I can't see for a very long time, but at the point in which I do stop working and I look back on my legacy, it will be that I've impactfully changed hundreds, if not thousands of people's lives and their families' lives for generations to come. And um, it's, it's really heartwarming yeah. to hear that. Yeah, of course. And what I think is interesting on that too is you go back to you know emotional decisions and all that. At the end of the day, people really just care about achieving their goal. Yeah. They don't care about the zeros on the bank account. And when they're, you know, when they're panicking because the stock market's crashing, they probably don't realize this. But the reason why they're panicking is because it's affect, it's going to affect their goals that they can achieve down the track. 100%. And so, JK, I'm going to wrap things up there. I'm sure we could speak about psychology <laughs> and investing and, and wealth creation for a long time. But... Um, for all the viewers and listeners out there, hopefully this has been really insightful to understand the impact that your behaviors and the psychology and psychology has in regards to your investment success and your wealth creation success. So until next time, have a good one. And thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And thanks, JK. Thanks, man.